Theopolis has a tagline of Bible, liturgy, and culture. And we pride ourselves in saying that Bible is at the heart of everything we do. It's at the heart of our liturgical theology. It's the heart of our cultural analysis. But it's hard to distinguish what we're doing with the Bible from what everybody else does. Uh, we can describe our Bible reading in various ways, but uh, trying to specify exactly how what we're contributing to the discussion about the Bible uh, has proven somewhat difficult. It, we try to look for an elevator pitch, and unless you're in uh, a, a hundred story elevator with, a, with an old slow elevator, you won't get it all out before you get to, the, get to your floor. Uh, you've spoken in terms of transfigural reading of the Bible at our recent Dallas course, and uh, that's, that's one dimension of what we're trying to get at. Yes. When we're reading the text of Scripture, it's recognizing that within this text, we're not just encountering literary connections between various passages and Scripture or notions, but we're encountering the presence of God himself and the glory of Christ is at the heart of the Scriptures. That understanding, I think, helps us to read the Bible with a degree of confidence that a mere literary approach, I think, would miss. Mm -hmm. And your transfigural, suggestion of transfigural reading is coming from uh, your study of the, of the actual the transfiguration and how that brings together different biblical themes. Yes, when we read the story of the transfiguration, one of the things that we are seeing there is the glory of a theophany and a theophany that's connected to and which alludes to a series of theophanies in the Old Testament. Now, within the Old Testament, these theophanies are often events that are deeply mysterious where the figure, the theophanic figure, is not truly perceived, um, is only perceived in part. So the train of the robe filling the temple in Isaiah 6, or something like Ezekiel's vision of a figure in Ezekiel chapter 1, or something like Moses seeing the back of God in Exodus. In all of these cases, we're seeing part of the figure but we're not actually seeing the face. We're not seeing who it is. And within the New Testament, in the event of the Transfiguration, and also in something like John's Gospel, there is close attention to the one who is perceived, the one whose glory it is. And recognizing in the event of the Transfiguration that it is Christ's glory that is the glory of God, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, as Paul talks about it in um, chapter 3, Four, three and four of Second Corinthians. In these events, we're seeing something about what the prophets saw, what they were anticipating, and also what all the testimony of the Old Testament refers to. Those are the ones that speak of Christ. And in that encounter, you're not just finding a fulfillment of Old Testament types, partial theophanies fulfilled in the glory that's in the face of Jesus. In uh, reading, hearing, encountering the text in the liturgy, there's actual a personal encounter with the living Christ in the Spirit, which is transfigural for the hearer, the listener, the one who receives the, re receives the scripture in the liturgy. And when we read the story of the transfiguration, it's not just Christ that they see on the mount. They see, in a way that they've never seen them before, Elijah and Moses, the law and the prophets, testifying to him, speaking about what he is about to do. And that... In the liturgy, when we're reading the Old Testament, we're encountering Christ and his witnesses that surround him. Sometimes that, that kind of reading, a spiritual, finding spiritual sense or transfigural reading as you're describing it, uh, is seen as something that's done at the expense of the letter. Uh, when I was writing my book, Deep Acts of Jesus, my, my working subtitle, the subtitle that I proposed to the, uh, to the uh, publisher, which was rejected as all my titles and subtitles are, was a, a, a hermeneutic of the letter. Because I think, uh, I, I do want to talk about multiple senses, a spiritual sense, transfigural sense, but that's never at the expense of the, of the letter of the text. Uh, and I think of a, a, an example of this that relates to what you were just saying. Uh, Moses up on the mountain sees the glory of God and he returns down from the mountain. And uh, the, t the Hebrew text says that he's horned. Uh, his face is shining with glory. That's the way it's usually translated. But uh, Michelangelo was correct to put horns on Moses um, in his uh, famous statue because that's what, the, that's what the Hebrew text actually says. Um, 
And that is describing a certain phenomenon. It's describing a, a face that's shining with beams of light. So you can see why they would translate the way it did. But what we want to do is follow up the actual way that that's stated. The horns represent that. You could state that in other, otherwise than saying that his face was horned. Uh, you could say his face shone, or you could say his face was light, or something like that. But the fact that it's horned leads you in different directions. Uh, Moses comes down from the mountain. He's going to lead Israel to the land instead of the horned calf that, that he destroys at the foot of the mountain. Uh, he's like, he is like a, 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 like you could say, a kind of a cherubic figure. He's the bull face of the cherubim. Uh, horns um, on a head also connect with crowns. Uh, crowns are uh, in headgear in, in the ancient world, often horned, representing the, the leader as some kind of powerful animal. Um, so all those connotations are in there, but you get to those, and those are expanded senses, but you get to those by following the letter, that's the, the actual word that's used in the text. I think when people read a passage like Galatians 4, as Paul discusses Sarah and Hagar, and then the relationship between Ishmael and Isaac, and how that depicts or helps us to understand the relationship between the church and unbelieving Jews, many people read that and they think, allegory that Paul is doing violence to the text of scripture but yet when we read Genesis there is a lot of foundation for what he's doing within the actual words of the text itself and many people I think pit the sort of reading that we're advocating for over against a grammatical historical reading or something that's very attentive to the letter but I think what we're trying to do is have a, a fuller grammatical historical reading that many people have formally um explored because within the text itself there is the ground for reading in this way and the apostles were doing this themselves. And one of the ways that it comes out in Genesis, uh, the particular example that you give is you've talked about the diptych structure of Genesis and how Isaac and Ishmael are set up in this kind of contrast. Uh, that's not something that Paul imposes on the text or Hagar and Sarah is not something Paul imposes on the text but those are structures that are actually in the uh, in Genesis and the way the narrative is developed. We've spoken in the past within the circles of Theopolis and Biblical Horizons of interpretative maximalism and I think that's part of what's taking place here. A recognition that we want to get all that is conveyed by the text out of it. We don't want to be those who stop short um, with trepidation in actually discovering something that might um, unsettle our sense of the text fitting into a tidy set of categories. Mm -hmm. So we want to say that our reading is transfigural in the way that you described it. We want to say it's literal, it's following the letter. Uh, we also use the word typological to describe what we're doing. But as soon as I say that, I want to explain what I mean by that because people often think of typology as kind of an a, uh, unnecessary, delightful, but not theologically substantive flourish on the literal meaning of the text. And I want to say that the typological meaning is much more fundamental than that. Um, most of our Christology comes from New Testament typological readings of Old Testament titles and, uh, and, and uh, narratives, uh, putting Jesus, uh, describing Jesus' life in terms of the history of Israel, describing Jesus in terms of Moses' life, uh, presenting Jesus therefore as a great prophet, Jesus as the son of David. All these are typological designations. So, it's not, it's not that typology is a, is a kind of uh, extra, added extra. Uh, also, typology can, can uh, imply to people that we're kind of moving from the historical uh, setting of the Bible into something else, into some maybe interior spiritual experience, uh, some kind of, you're moving from the natural world to the supernatural, into a supernatural level. But... Uh, Typology is actually a way of reading history. It's not just a literary theory or a theory about how the Bible works. And that recognition of the historical char character of typology, that's not just one level that we leave behind the historical and the concrete and move on to the spiritual and ahistorical, timeless level. That recognition, I think, is one that helps us to see that typology discloses the unity of God's work in history, that there are times that interpenetrate each other, that when Christ steps into the Jordan to be baptized, there is 
a relationship between a whole lot of different times. He is David being um, anointed by Samuel before facing Goliath, who stands against the people of God for 40 days. He's Israel prepared to go cross the Red Sea and enter into the wilderness or to enter into the promised land. He's Jacob who's about to wrestle and have that experience of testing and then be identified in a new way. In each one of these cases, we're having something that discloses the meaning of that particular event in history. So it's not a departure from that, it's actually a disclosure of it. But also in the same way, it sheds light on those previous events and manifests their connection with what Christ is doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, another dimension to that, we want to insist that uh, what Jesus accomplishes is uh, truly analogous to what's done in the Old Testament, a greater fulfillment. But again, that greater fulfillment can sometimes move in the direction of some something purely spiritual that doesn't touch the history of nations in the world. I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of the way Exodus typologies are sometimes understood. Uh, in the Old Testament, there was an Exodus out of Egypt, uh, a great power when they're in slavery, literal slavery, and they're liberated from that to Sinai and eventually into the land. But when you read that typologically, that's a, that's a, uh, a storyline about our deliverance from slavery to sin, the flesh, and the devil, which is true. I don't want to, I'm not denying that. But at the same time, uh, the Exodus language in the New Testament is sometimes applied to the Exodus of uh, the people of God out of old structures, the, the decayed structures of Judaism, the rebellious structures of Judaism. So there's a real sociological or political dimension to the typology that's, that, that some versions of typology miss. And as you say, I think that recognition that what's happening in Christ is not purely just purely spiritual. Conversely, when we're reading the Old Testament, it's not purely flesh or um, physical, this mere national significance of what's happening in the Exodus, these sorts of events. There is, as you have put it in your work, in your um, priesthood of the plebs, there is a conjugation of a single root. The, and the, that, that uh, social political dimension is another important part of what we're getting at uh, when our work on the Bible. Um, you started, we started talking about, with, about transfigural reading where everything comes to culmination in Christ. Our reading is radically Christ-centered. We want to see that Jesus is the key to everything. But Jesus is the key to everything as the King, as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And those are, uh, those are real uh, political claims uh, that are built into uh, the, the uh, explicit statements of the Bible, but they're built into the, the structure of biblical history and the structure of Scripture as a whole. Those, those claims about uh, Christ's role, political role and uh, political kingship, his, uh, his, his uh, rule over the nations are built into that. So we're theopolis. We want the political side of that to be highlighted. And, and again, this is, uh, separates what we're doing somewhat from some versions of typology because we want to emphasize that real world application and that real world message that uh, the Bible gives us. I think that brings us to another aspect of what we're doing, which is connecting the Bible with liturgy, that we enter into these patterns, these types, these symbols, when we are baptized, we are participating in the reality of Christ being baptized in the Jordan, the baptism of his death, the baptism of the church at Pentecost, and then all the baptisms behind that, mm -hmm. the baptism of um, crossing the Red Sea, the baptism of the flood, the baptism of the world being formed out of water. All of these events lie behind what's happening to us. Mm -hmm. And that movement from the scripture into the living experience of the people of God at this moment in time in history I think, again, represents something of the distinctive emphasis of the Theopolitan hermeneutic mm -hmm. that we're putting forward. So, so the Bible plays a couple of roles in, in our uh, discussions of liturgy. Uh, the Bible is taught, read, encountered in the liturgy. And in a sense, uh, the typologies of the Bible are made real in the rites of the church. Um, at the same time, we're also saying that the Bible, you know, we, we operate by something like the uh, the old reformed uh, uh, regulative principle of worship that the Bible is what the Bible tells us how we're supposed to worship, and so we want to read the Bible in a way that actually gives us guidance for uh, uh, what order we should put the liturgy in. Uh, 
what, uh, what kinds of hymns and songs should we sing? What role does music play in the worship? How often should we have uh, communion? Uh, what should the minister be wearing during a worship service? All those, the Bible informs all of those, as well as being at the heart of the liturgy itself. The liturgy is, a, is God's, uh, God's gift of word and sacrament to us. He speaks to us, He feeds us, and uh, the, the uh, realities that, are, that, that the Bible speaks about are brought to us and made real to us in the liturgy. And that movement from the scripture to the liturgy is also a movement from the liturgy to the scripture. That when we're reading the scripture, we are reading it as those who exist within its world. Um, we are reading it as those who are the heirs and executors of the biblical testament. And that, I think, in itself presents a very significant movement away from the way that many people read the Bible, which is a book that's out there that may have some interesting parallels with our lives, some interesting moral lessons that we can apply, but it's not truly a world that we inhabit. Mm -hmm. So um, I think those who are listening in can see why this is not an elevator pitch. We've spent maybe 10 minutes trying to describe what it is we're doing. And we've used a bunch of different terms to do that. Uh, transfigural, typological. We've wanted to emphasize the political significance of the scriptures, the liturgical significance of the scriptures. We want to say the, the words on the page are essential. We're following, we're following where the words on the page lead us. Um, and so it's difficult to summarize all that. We could, we could, we could become German and just make a phrase with hyphenated, hyphenated terms. It's a typological, transfigural, the, uh, political, whatever. Uh, I think uh, this is why I've come to the point of just describing it as the, the Theopolitan hermeneutic. Uh, it's, it is something that I think gives us, get, is a kind of unique packages, package of different emphases that we find in different parts of the church. A, a Theopolitan hermeneutic brings us all this together in a way that uh, is radically Christ-centered, it's uh, manifested and unfolded in the liturgy. It's culturally and politically relevant. And um, I have no better way of summarizing that than calling it a Theopolitan hermeneutic.